Hey everybody, I'm Jeff Watson. Welcome back to another episode of In Conversation With. This time I've got a good old friend of mine called Mitch Lacey, one of my oldest Agile friends. Not that he's old, just I've known him for a long time. Uh, and he's been in the Agile space for a long time as well, despite how gorgeously young he looked. And I've managed to get him, despite the time zone differences, being on the west coast of the States, we've uh, we managed to find some time together to have a bit of a chat. So without knowing where this is going to go, uh, in homage to our old drinking days, it's five o'clock here. It may not be for you, but cheers. Oh, man, I'm so jealous. All I have is coffee. You're killing me. Well, there you go. So, yeah, for those of you that don't know Mitch, and I'm sure most of you do, Mitch is uh, used to work at um, Microsoft and was one of the first Scrum trainers uh, in the world, uh, most experienced Agile people in the world, written the Scrum Field Guide, great book for getting started with, with Agile, with Scrum done loads of videos and online training and stuff like that, and just generally a great person to have a beer with. So, Mitch, what have you been up to recently? Hey, Jeff. Well, not much. It is, <laughs> it is uh, great the time frame. <laughs> well, yeah. No, what have I been up to recently? Oh, my gosh. Um, we got chickens. Chickens? Chickens. You're going we got all chickens. Uh, end of the world apocalypse now. Yeah, yeah. No guns, just chickens. Yeah, so okay. it's all good given our current political climate. No, yeah, we got chickens. I guess that's I guess that's new. You know, a little more, a little more gray hair. Like well, you hide it better than I do. So, but yeah, we got chickens. Chickens, chickens are new okay. in our work wise. You still traveling a lot? Still traveling a lot work wise. Noticing a lot of crazy things out there. Had a couple things I thought I'd share with you and your. Okay and your viewers but yeah yeah i've um been been going places doing things and stuff and uh so what have you picked up recently you, you on social media a lot and blogs? no yeah no i i try to avoid it i yeah. i'm 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 there but i'm not okay. uh i i have i here's one thing i have gotten and i don't know if you've gotten this this question in your adventures uh with with customers clients companies whatever it is i always get this question about you know how should we start and where do we go and you know, how, how do we how do we get everything going and yeah. um what i have what i've started noticing and you've probably seen the same thing people will go pick up and they pick scrum because it's mm -hmm. the easiest thing to pick up they'll go pick up scrum and they'll go all right we're gonna go be agile and we're gonna go do scrum and then they do a daily meeting and then they wonder why Scrum has so many meetings. And then they say, let's do the daily meeting once a week and call it the daily meeting. And let's do a retrospective every six weeks because, you know, who's got time for that? And planning takes too long. So we'll send one person to do all the planning for the team. And, and then, of course, the, their transition fails or people start struggling because they're really focusing on how versus why. Okay, yeah. Is that You see that? Yeah, 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 definitely. So, the, the lack of understanding about why, definitely. Yeah, the lack of understanding about why. And so obviously we could go down the path and say, well, it's, in, it, it's important to understand the values and principles. It's important to know the Agile Manifesto. It's important to understand blah, 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 blah. That, that's, all, that's all fine and dandy. Um, but I've been, I, was, I did a workshop with a couple of friends of mine, Brad Wilson and Scott Densmore. They're both over at Microsoft in, oh my gosh, App Center, I think it's called. I, I forgot what the group name is, but uh, these are people that I've been doing crazy agile stuff with forever. And, um, you know, they've, they've left Microsoft. They've gone back. I think Scott's on his third time. Mm -hmm. And so we were, we were having a discussion with another, another team over there recently and a topic came up, which I've started to notice across the board with all these other organizations that I'm really starting to drive towards. And, and it just really was reinforced for me with, with Brad and Scott, which was, Teams have to have a, a mission statement. Okay. And I don't mean a team like a small team. I mean, you know, you know, we're talking 50 to 350 people here. They got to have a mission statement. They got to understand uh, what it is they're doing and they got to understand why they're doing it. So, you know, you can come up with something super big and giant, but for example, Brad and Scott's is make, make, make application development 10 times easier. Okay. And you would think about that and go, okay, well, that's nice, but you know, how do we do it? People have to get behind it. And so then they go through and they created their own values. Now these are public and I'll see if I can get the link for you, but I, I got them here and I want to, I want to read these off because 
they really start sort of meaning a lot to me. So I'm going to, of course, my eyes are going to switch. So they have, they have four of them. They have uh, customer obsession, simplicity, no silos, and then a growth mindset. So let's start at the bottom. So growth mindset is for them, they say that we can be 10 times better. And, and they can be 10 times better. And Microsoft has this whole thing going on right now with growth mindset, growth mindset. And if you haven't, go read the book. Yeah. Go, go read. Say again? Dweck, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So great stuff, right? Growth mindset. Um, and, and the silos, they have, you know, one team, one repository, and, and, they're, and, and, and one goal. So we're all working together in the same organization. We all have the same mission of making app to application development 10 times easier. Mm-hmm. Simplest simplicity, right? What's the easiest thing that will work for us? And then customer obsession. Customer obsession is actually first, first on the list. Um, and the thing that I that I liked about this when they had their silos things, because what they did is they went and added a bunch of little little snippets. Uh, so for no silos, they have no code names. Uh, uh, we have no code names or acronyms which create identity outside of what matters. We value collective ownership, and when making decisions, and this was really my this is really my favorite. Uh, we ask what is best for blank in, in where blank is in the following order. What is the best for our customer? What is the best for Microsoft? What is the best for App Center? What is the best for my team? And then last, what is best for me? Mm. Right. And so I looked at this and I said to him, I'm like, so, so what happened? Are people rallied around this? And, you know, there was some, of course, hesitation, but being the senior guys that they're in the company, they said, this is what we're doing in our group. This is how things are going to work. And this is what we're driving towards. And so I started then looking at, at some of my other customers that are going through a transition and, and they're struggling. And I would say, okay, well, what are your values? What are your missions? And they, of course, would go, well, we, uh, you know, we value feedback quickly and we value being faster to market. and We value basically a bunch of buzzwords without a lot of understanding. And I said, okay, well, do you guys have any sort of team rules of engagement? Do you have any team values or organizational values? Or, you know, how, what's your litmus test for, for why? And people, you know, they do the, the, the puppy dog sort of blank stare look. And so then the shift focuses on, all right, this is where we got to start. We got to go create a mission statement, you know, and by we, I mean you. And we got to work through these values things and figure out, you know, what, what do you guys value? And so I would use this as an example. I would use others as an example um, that, that really this is what this becomes sort of the rallying cry that an organization needs to be able to have a successful transition. And I find that when these things are missing, people just, they like, yeah, who cares? Management forced me to go to this training. So I'm here, mm-hmm. you know, I'm still just doing my job on the side. I don't really care about anything, but, but here we are. And, and it just turns into a, for lack of a better word, a shit show. <laughs> so, yeah, you're right. It's, it's past the past the watershed somewhere. So, yeah, you're killing me with that beer, dude. That's right, man. So I, I just I like that, and the 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 why, and there may well there may well be a very good reason behind an organization saying we're going to do Scrum. There may be a really powerful and compelling why behind that, but if that why isn't explained, if that doesn't tap into and doesn't engage and doesn't hook the individuals, then it's just something that no, no matter what it is, is being done to them. And most people will resist anything that's being done to them, regardless of how good it is for them. So yeah. what you've what you've explained there is that you've, you've created this sense of something that's been created by the group that, that, they, that they all can relate their own personal values to. Yeah. 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 But it's, but it's, I would say it's more than that because it's not necessarily personal values, right? So if we think about like the no silos one, the thing that is being combated there is the mindset of me, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to save the day. I'm the rock star. I'm the hero. I'm the architect. I'm the designer. I'm, I'm the dev. I'm the SQL person. I'm the security expert. Yeah. And so it, it gets away from that and it goes back down to the, no, it's, it's, this is what we collectively are responsible for. Yeah. Because we're collectively responsible. Uh, some people have more skills mm-hmm. or competencies in one area, some less in another area, but they compensate in another. Yeah. Right. And so if you think about like, like, a, like a pie chart or whatever, the people can overlay in the most part of the circle. 
uh, which is which is really what needs to happen versus, okay, you only do this, you only do this, you only do this, which takes away from a growth mindset. Yeah. But in order for me to, to be part of that, I've got to give up a little bit of being selfish, right? So I sacrifice yeah. something to become part of something bigger. Yeah. And, and so I know you're not a Star Trek fan. Okay. However. You're going to talk you, about you, Borgs, aren't you? No, 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 no. We can, but we, we, we know, we know Vulcan, right? The Vulcan race, you know, Spock, mm, right? the, needs, Spock. the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. And I don't know how many times I catch myself saying that within, within, within a company and go, look, I, I understand you like doing that. I understand that is your comfort zone. And I understand that is fun, but you got to look beyond and you got to have that courage to be able to step up and say, yeah, I don't, I don't really know how to do that. Yeah. And being able to do that is a, is a sign of maturity. It's a sign of uh, exposing yourself in a, in a good way. Yeah. Um, and, and it's hard, right? It's hard to be able to sit back and go, well, yeah, I don't know how to do that. And I would like help. Oh my gosh. Asking help is like, you know, some of the, um, well, you and I will remember this because we have gray hair asking for directions in public, you know, before technology, right? Mm-hmm. Doing that with your wife or girlfriend present. Yeah, you just don't do it. You just don't do it. Yeah. Why, why would I'm not last? I know exactly where I'm going. Well, where are you going? I'm going straight ahead. Oh. Yeah, we've done that. Yeah. Well, we'll do, we're going to do it again. We're going to get it right the 50th time. So when, <laughs> the other thing that, so I, I, when you were talking through, uh, talking through those aspects there and you, you came up with no silos and that just reminded me of a conversation we were having many, many years ago and about something that frustrated both of us about the big organizations that we were in. And how silos were just a, a huge impediment to getting something valuable done, and, and that both both annoying for us. The other thing I, I, I picked up from there, which just reminded me, brought back a bit of nostalgia, was the idea of no acronyms um, outside of what's valuable or what's useful. And I remember we, we used to have a competition about who could name the most TLAs. You know, did Microsoft or BT have the most acronyms? Um, yeah. That, that was it's it, the whole acronym thing is is such a you maybe this not word might not mean so much for you guys but something I'm trying to get into America the, the whole idea of marmite a marmite word is something either you love or you hate <laughs> yeah I, I would I would agree with that assessment yeah people people love acronyms but they also hate them they're they're a code that bonds people together you know they're part of our identity what makes us us but they also exclude and that there's an attractiveness to excluding people because then you feel more included but equally there's a downside to it as well and so i'd love that idea of no acronyms that what say that again for me it was to do with that, that, that get in the way of value or something no code names or acronyms which create identity outside of what matters yeah that i love so that doesn't that doesn't mean we can't have acronyms. Yeah. But they've got to be helpful, they've got to be inclusive, they've got to be about what matters. I like that. Yeah, so two of my favorite ones and, and whenever I go to your side of the world, <laughs> people always people always look at me a little funny with these cuz I I start off with with my favorite one which is hey, Jeff, WTF. <laughs> right? Which you're laughing because you're like, you're drinking a beer and I would go WTF. Hey, Jeff. Wow. That's funny. <laughs> right. Cause I don't know what else it would mean. Well, yeah, you know, sure. I'm just a lowly American. Um, and then the other one, of course, which is my favorite, which is uh, good for you yeah. or GFY for yeah. short. You introduced me to that. Yeah. Years ago, years ago. Good for you. Good for you, Jeff. I'm glad you're having a beer. Good for you. <laughs> and of course, yeah. Yep. In England, we have uh, See You Next Tuesday. Yeah, see, yeah, we have See You Next Tuesday here too. But I don't know, I don't know what that means because it seems to be always Tuesday. So. Yeah. Yes. So, so you're not on social media. You used to be. Well, I am. I'm on social media. I'm on Twitter. And I just, what I find is that uh, if I'm going to be doing things, reading and posting sometimes don't necessarily help me achieve the goal that I want to achieve for the day. Okay. So, yeah, they, they get in the way. Yeah, it gets it gets in the way, but I'm on there. I read. I read occasionally. Who do you like to read? Where, if you if you you know, if I was going to give you half an hour and say, right, Mitch, so you've got an extra half an hour today, but you can only use it to read stuff online. Who would you go and read? Trevor Noah. Yeah. So he was he used to be the host of the Late Show. Yes, 
Did he did he stop? I don't remember. Is he still? I don't know. Because you have yeah. All right, well, I'm reading this book right now, and it's and it's fascinating. Having been to South Africa many times. Born um, crime, right? Yeah, it's it's uh, it it's like it. it's a it's a it's a great read, and it's interesting now having having read that with that that angle or perspective on life growing up there and going there now and seeing things it's it's pretty eye-opening and and i've got a I've got another trip scheduled this year down to joburg and um it's you know it'll it'll be interesting it, it's going to be interesting how how my brain starts processing uh the images and the in the in the you know everything that it sees and everything that comes in because i'm going to look at things through a different light well, exactly. um, not a bad light, just a different light. Which exactly, I'm, which you, I'm have, you have a different lens, right? So you can only see things through the lens that you have. And that's a, we always used to say that And you know, when we were at BT and, and Microsoft, we saw the world as we saw it then, but we didn't have the lens that we have now. And if we went back to then with the lens that we have now, we would see very different things, right? If, I, yeah. if, 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 you, if you mention the whole idea of you know, if, if suddenly... Well, so I've just, my wife just had a baby and, and you know that. And if we started talking about that and you go outside, you'll start to notice more new babies. You, you just see them more because that's the front of your mind, right? Yeah. That's by, the world. That's the world you're in. By your, your consciousness, by widening your horizons and focusing on different things, you see different things. So whereas if, you, if you're just going along blindly, you, your cognitive biases will just take hold and, and you'll only see what you expect to see. Yeah, or or worse, what you you know what you want to see, and you ignore everything else and just pretend it doesn't exist or it's not real or it's son of a bitch, <laughs> somebody else's problem. Oh, I love this. What's the mess? You get you have you played with this on your little Android phone? So Android has this little now thing where you can you can screen the call so you can see it's sort of screening it and okay. it puts some words in there and they hang up because they're a spam caller and they suck. I thought that was muted. That was muted last hour. All right, mute for one hour. Done. So, <laughs> we can keep it in there. I don't really care. You're having a beer, so you still good for you. You still yeah, suck. a little bit more informal. Yeah, yeah, a bit more informal. Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah, it's interesting that you you do only see things through 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 the current lens that you have, which is which is one of the reasons why I really have enjoyed reading that book. I'm not done with it yet by any means, but I enjoy reading it. And, and it's, it's going to be, it's going to be fun because I'm taking, I'm taking my son down there as well. And he's already told me I'm not reading anything. I hate reading. And I've told him that good for you. You're going to read the book. So. Well, I had the audio book and he read it himself and ah. that is a lot because he, he, he's obviously a natural entertainer and you know, he's a presenter and a comedian yeah everything so he's, he's very talented at it but it's his story and I think him telling his story made it more powerful than me reading his story mm. that might be I know my, my kids prefer to have audio books to physical books or reading books that could be a an alternative that's a good idea so I'm just pop, popped in my mind because I, I keep looking at your shed yeah and I like I like the paneling I like how you did it um did you notice any correlation to the shed construction mm. and scrum? Um, I mean, it wasn't built incrementally. It was a one-off mm -hmm. build, but it was just, uh, how many people? Two, maybe three people. So they weren't, they weren't specialists. Okay. So they, would, they, would, they would be able to do the foundations and, and lay the concrete base and cut the wood and do the jointing and put the, put the double glazing windows in, put the electrics in, put the fireplace in, you know, run the safety test. So between the two or three of them, they did everything. Um, and you couldn't, you couldn't, by looking at them, say, okay, that's the, the foundations guy or that's yeah. the, the lighting guy or whatever. And they got so much done in such a small team and it was, it was quite fun to watch in a way, not just watching it being built, but they had fun doing it. They're obviously mm -hmm. quite a close group that have done this a lot and they take a lot of pride in their work. Um, and they, yeah, they knew what each other could do. There was a lot of tacit conversation going on. So I, I, I liken that to a lot of the, the successful scrum teams that I've been part of. 
But you've done so, quite bigger renovations, right? Your place, you've actually yeah, we yeah we yeah we basically gutted our house and you know tore it down to the to the frame and the foundation. So we had the the exterior walls, some of the interior walls, you know, oh everything was exposed. Mm -hmm. uh, but what I noticed when we were doing it, so there were a few problems. Uh, what would happen? The, the guys who who did the work, I hired out um, through my friend who I grew up with. And his name's Yoakum, and he's a Finnish guy. And so he would come over with his with his other other two crewmates. Um, so similar experience, right? They're all jack of all trades, let's say. Uh, but we would do stuff, and we would work, and and I would, you know, be the be the helper, if you will. And I started noticing some patterns in the fact that decisions decisions would be needed, but they would be needed immediately. So we had the surprise factor. So, for example. Um, Yoakum would say, all right, so we're going to do, we're going to start the bathroom tile next week. And I would be like, great, let's start the bathroom tile. And he would said, where's the material? And I would go, well, we haven't picked it out yet. And he would go, <laughs> you need to pick it out. And so my wife and I, we would rush down to the tile store. We would look frantically and go, I think this will work. So yeah. very reactive. We would try to go purchase the tile and they would say, okay, well, it's out of stock. It'll be four weeks. And we would, Oh my gosh. And we would go do it again and again and again. And then we would eventually come back to Yoakum and say, man, we're not gonna have the tile for three weeks. And he would go, well, that screws up my schedule. So we had this communication problem mm. um, where we were you know, noticing and identifying impediments late. So what we started to do was we would meet and do a daily meeting uh, to walk through and say, you know, what's our plan for the day? What's and, and largely what's our goal for the week? So what what are the things that we want to achieve this week? We had stickies up on on a on a, on a piece of plywood um, held on with nails, and so we would do that. the The communication problem still didn't it, it helped, but it didn't really address the issue. So then, what what my wife and I started to do was on the weekend, on a Sunday, we would walk through and we would go, okay, let's. You know, what do we want? So what's our vision? So now we're playing the role of the stakeholder, the customer. What's our vision for the week? Okay. And we would, we would walk and say, well, we want to try to get this done, this done, this done. So Yoakum would always come Monday morning about a half hour early. And we would walk him through what we talked about. He would say, yeah, that's not feasible. You need to consider this. You need to consider this. Uh, the rest of the crew would come in and we would, for the most part, have now a plan for the week. And we would, we would do this to make sure then about the, that that week was good, but then we would also look after the crew got started, we would take yoga on the side and go, okay, here's our plan for the week after. And we would look about four weeks out. Here's what we think we're trying to achieve. What problems do you see? What do you forecast? What do you think we need? Um, okay. You know, because because time to acquire goods and lead times and all that would, would start coming into play. And, you know, if you're paying essentially $200 an hour to, to have these people do the work, yeah. Whether they're working or not, you're paying them, mm -hmm. and it and it becomes a, a really interesting mindset around. Hey, as a product owner or as a stakeholder, right? This is direct out of pocket money. Yeah, I need to have fiscal responsibility. I have fiscal responsibility on my own. Why do I not have fiscal responsibility at work? Because you probably see this all the time, where you get a product owner at work and they just yeah willy nilly and they're not prepared and and nobody cares. And what's worse is they lack fiscal responsibility. Additionally, the people doing the work lack, lack fiscal responsibility because they don't have quality. They don't have levels of ownership. They don't, they just don't care. It's like, I'm going to do my job. I'm going to do my job. I'm going to do my job. And it's good enough. Hmm. And, and, and I always think back and I go, it's not good enough because, and I've said this a million times, if I was to go to a restaurant and you guys have fancy steak places there in London, yeah. you know, if I go to a fancy steak place, um, actually chicken is actually a better example because it's easier because steak is great, medium rare. But if I go order some chicken at a restaurant, first of all, if they bring it out to me and it's half cooked, say to maybe, you know, 30, 30 or 40 degrees and, you know, it's raw on the inside. And then I go, this is, this is unacceptable. It's, un it's undercooked. If the response from the waiter is, it's okay, just eat around it. You know, we'll finish the rest later. It's, it's fine. <laughs> I wouldn't eat the meal, nor would I pay for the meal. <laughs> I'd like to see that. I'd like to see them try that with you. Well, right. Well, I mean, try, try it with anybody. I mean, if, if it's not, if it's not done right, like think about the beer you're drinking, let's say you order a, a, a pint and, and they bring you a glass of wine. You'd go, no, I ordered a pint. Yeah. Sorry. The guy who pours the beer is out sick. You get wine today. <laughs> and, and by the way, it costs more than the pint. So here's your bill. You'd be like, mm, piss off. Right. 
<laughs> and, and of course, if we think about our corporate world and we think about product owners and we think about teams, teams deliver half to big chicken all the time. Product owners don't really care. Well, and go to a, go to, this goes back to what we started with, really, isn't it? And oh, exactly. Yeah. Values and principles and having a mission statement. Um, and, and, and I think you're right. Having that sense of you know, treating, well, I was always taught treat company, but I was trained as an accountant, treat company funds as if they were your own, right? And, and mm-hmm. as a self-employed person who runs their own business, that's, that's a lot easier to do because it kind of is. Yeah. But the best product owners do treat their products as if they were funding them themselves, as if they yeah. were building them and, and, and putting them out and almost they were their own children in a way. Yeah. Treating them with such responsibility but then how do you get that within the team because you know they don't have that financial responsibility but what you're talking about there is around that sense of professional pride and, and quality and knowing that i'm doing a good job and also contributing to a, a, a product that's actually going to provide value to people exactly um and, and here like here's here's a story that i would say so it's about the pride it's about the quality it's about all that stuff but think about now think about um think about this sort of sort of more of a startup mindset so like eric reese's book lean startups a great book um and eric's a nice nice person if you think about uh, a startup and i've worked in a lot of startups back in the in the boom and bust dot com eras mm-hmm. you know if if I was to, like, I would, I would say to teams, you know, I would say to our people, look, if you guys, if you build crap, we lose customers and we don't have a lot of customers, right? Those customers pay your paycheck. So if you want to deliver garbage, yeah. that's fine. Just understand, I'm, we're not going to have a paycheck, mm-hmm. right? And so I say this now, you go into a big company and you say, all right, imagine this, you're, you're the development team or you're the people doing the work. I'm the product owner. I'm representing the stakeholders. I'm the one who wants work done. The thing that I have is a bag of cash. The thing you have is a keyboard. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm, we're, going to, we're going to exchange just simple barter system. We're going to exchange time for money. You're going to generate things that I want of qualities that I expect and demand. In fact, just I'm not going to negotiate. And in exchange, I'm going to give you money so that you can continue on living. So one of the things that I've done in projects, uh, and this is really a good selling feature, and I have this as a chapter in my book, One of the things I do in projects is I say, look, if you don't like the work that we do, we'll show you something every week or every two weeks, but never more than two weeks. We're going to show you something. And you, the customer, you will either accept it or reject it. Now, if you accept it, you pay us. We will give you an invoice and you will pay the bill. If you reject it and you say, this is not what I meant, not what I expected, I don't like it, I don't accept it, then then we just did two or two weeks of work or one week of work for free. You don't have to pay the bill. It's not that we're going to make it up in the next one. You don't pay the bill. And if you, if you have that in place, because, because everybody sells jobs and everybody says, well, you know, I still have to pay the invoice, even if I get delivered garbage, because you built what I asked for, not what I meant. I want to build what you meant. And I want to be a partner. And there's a big difference between being a partner versus a vendor, Definitely. right? So how do we make people successful? How do we help companies achieve their goals versus how do I just execute what you're asking for? And that's a huge shift in mindset where you get, again, tying it back to the beginning, got to have that mission statement, got to have those values and principles put in place for what the team believes and buys into. But I'm also a firm believer, just like in a restaurant, if I was served raw chicken, I wouldn't pay for the meal. If I was, if I'm paying a company to do work for me, I want them to help me achieve my goals. And if they deliver something that's wrong, I wouldn't, I wouldn't expect to pay the bill. That means, yeah, sorry guys, you're going to, you're going to have to go hungry for two weeks. But again, that's also collectively on the team as well. We don't get paid. Yeah, and and I, I know you had we had conversations years ago about this. In, in in a big organization, it's hard to get that sense of direct accountability and direct connection because yeah. I work with people that had been there for 20, 30 years and they knew they were never going to lose their job no matter what happened, no matter how incompetent they were. They yeah. basically were never going to get fired. Yeah. So there was no sense of accountability or responsibility. Um, so creating that sense of startup mentality, that, that direct connection, there's a huge upside to that, right? So all of the people, all the developers, the people who've been you know, bartering their keyboards for the cash that have had direct connection with the users and the customers have absolutely loved the opportunity to solve customers' problems and get direct 
uh, effectively feedback and, and appreciation for what they've done. That's a huge motivational factor. Yeah. But there's a huge yeah. downside as well, right? In that there's the risk there that I have to open myself up to the fact that if you don't like what I've done with good intentions, then I'm not going to get paid. Uh, and for people who you know are relying on paycheck to paycheck, now that that's that's a scary prospect when there is an alternative of I could take a really comfortable job and it doesn't matter whether the customer likes it because that's someone else's problem. Yep. 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 And and so if we talk about agile stuff and you know it's somebody else's problem if the customer likes it, yeah, it, it's a comfortable job and you know here that might not work. Mm-hmm. <laughs> other other countries in the world, they're you know. It, it might, yeah. but, but that's one of the things, you know, that it, it just, to me, it just comes down to that, that core mindset. And as, as we look at, you know, new generations coming into the workforce, people, of course, younger than you and I, uh, they want their quick wins and quick wins isn't the right word, but it's, you know, I, I want to, I want to deliver value. I want to receive feedback. I want to, I want to, I want to feel, I want to feel like I'm valued. Right? I want my voice to be heard. Um, and to me, that all starts with just accountability and ownership. If you don't, if you don't have it, um, people won't respect you. And if people don't respect you, they're probably not going to. They're just not going to care what you say. So, if you were uh, if you were running a, a, a big-ish company, let's call them Microsoft, um, <laughs> and you were looking to hire somebody in, in, a, in a development team, what's the number one thing you'd look for? Competencies, the ability to. I, I don't care. I never care what people's skills are. Um, I only care if they have the ability to learn, if they have the ability to, to share information, to be open, uh, to, to, to want to be able to be in that growth mindset, going back to, you know, the, the growth mindset thing, but to, to be there, if they're, if they're there, man, they're, they're an easy hire because skills can be learned. Yeah. Right? Skills can be learned, but competencies and those abilities just take years. And so I don't have years to invest. I have, I have weeks or months to invest. And if it's, if it's not there, it's not there. So you, so the successful companies hire for competencies, right? They hire for mindset. Uh, they don't hire for skill. Cool. So hire for mindset. I yeah. like it. That's a good I also got that as a chapter in my book too, because that was a pattern that I noticed over time. So, well, I know that I've taken up enough of your time. I nah, that. I've taken your time. You've got to enjoy the beer, and I know it's almost empty, which means you're going to need to go get another one. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. Good for you. Hopefully, <laughs> your, your next visit to the UK, you'll be able to join us in person, and we'll do a we'll do an agile podcast with you. That'd be perfect. That'd be fun. But until next time, thanks for joining us. Cheers, Mitch Lacey. Cheers, Jeff. Thank you. <laughs>